ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चरोतम दिव्य सरस्वती व्यास तथा मुदीर श्रीमद्भगवत कंतो एट चैप्टर ट्वेंटी टेक्स्ट फोर्टीन श्री सुखा उवाच एवंस्रादित शिष्य आनंदिशाखर गुरो ससापदेव प्रथिथ सत्यसंध्यम मनस्वीन श्री सुख उवाच अश्रादित शिष्य अनादिशाखर गुरो ससापदेव प्रथिथ सत्यम सध्यम मनस्वीन श्री सुख उवाच एवं श्रादित शिष्य अनादिशाखर गुरो ससापदेव प्रथित सत्य संध्यम मनस्वीन श्री सुखा उवाच श्री सुखदेव गोस्वामी सैद एवं दस असरादित हु वॉज नॉट वेरी रिस्पेक्टफुल टू द इनकारनेशन सॉरी टू द इंस्ट्रक्शंस ऑफ द स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर शिष्यम ऑन टू सच अ डिसाइपल Anadisakaram, who was not prepared to carry out the order of the spiritual master, Guru, the spiritual master, Sukacharya, Sasapa, cursed, Deva Prathita. being inspired by the supreme lord satya sandam one who was fixed in his truthfulness manas vinam who was of the high was of a highly elevated character Translation of Prabhupada by the Vangar Sila Prabhupada Ki. Sri Sukadev Goswami continued. Thereafter, the spiritual master, Sukracharya, being inspired by the Supreme Lord, cursed his exalted disciple Bali Maharaj, who was so magnanimous and fixed in truthfulness that instead of respecting his spiritual master's instruction, he wanted to disobey his order please repeat sri sukadev goswami continued thereafter 
the spiritual master, Sukracharya, being inspired by the Supreme Lord, cursed his exalted disciple Bali Maharaj, who was so magnanimous and fixed in truthfulness that instead of respecting his spiritual master's instructions, he wanted to disobey his order. Report. The difference between the behavior of Bali Maharaj and that of his spiritual master, Sukracharya, was that Bali Maharaj had already developed love of God, whereas Sukracharya, being merely a priest of routine rituals, had not. The Sukracharya was never inspired by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to develop in devotional service, as stated by the Lord himself in Bhagavad Gita 10.10. Tesam satatam yuktanam, bhatatam priti purvakam, dadami buddhi yogam tam, yena mam upayanti te. To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. Devotees who actually engage in devotional service with faith and love are inspired by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vaishnavas are never concerned with ritualistic smarter Brahmanas. Srila Sanatan Goswami has therefore compiled the Hari Bhakti Vilas to guide the Vaishnav, who never follow the smarter vidi. Although the Supreme Lord is situated in the core of everyone's heart, unless one is a Vaishnav, unless one is engaged in devotional service, one does not get sung advice by which to return home back to Godhead. Such instructions are meant only for devotees. Therefore, in this verse, the word Deva Prahitaha, being inspired by the Supreme Lord, is important. Sukracharya should not have encouraged Baliya Maharaj to give every Sukracharya could have encouraged Bali Maharaj to give everything to the Lord Vishnu. This would have been a sign of love for the Supreme Lord, but he did not do so. On the contrary, he wanted to punish his deci devoted disciple by cursing him. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, before we go on, we like to seek the blessings of all our superiors, especially Marge, who is here, and ensure respect, uh, so that by their blessings, we'll be enabled to both speak and hear this subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, for this subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam is most essential to the living entity. Unless the living entity is fortunate enough to receive this mercy of the devotees, the sadhus, the spiritual master in Srimad Bhagavatam, then it's very difficult for him to attain this process of devotional service. This Srimad Bhagavatam, unlike other scriptures, uh, stands supreme because of this subject matter that we are discussing in this text. Because of this emphasis, the whole emphasis of the Srimad Bhagavatam is centered around this basic principle as to how to teach the living entity how to, again, uh, 
reawaken this dormant love for the Supreme Personality of God. Uh, this subject matter will be there in other scriptures because this is why they enable it. One of the factors that enable a scripture to be bona fide in that uh, it speaks about the loving God. But in different scriptures, the emphasis is not, it's to diff on different levels. But the Srimad Bhagavatam, this emphasis is wholly and solely well, emphasizing the Srimad Bhagavatam. The whole subject matter of the Srimad Bhagavatam is meant to help the living entity to understand that he has an eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord and this eternal relationship is based on loving service. So how are he going to do that? What is his problem? What is his condition? Why should he do that? Why should the living entity want to engage in loving service to the Lord? Conditioned life, in general, means that the living entity is striving to satisfy his loving propensity. He is trying to do that. He Actually, the living entity can't give up that, that nature, his, his inborn nature to love and be loved. He, he, he always wants that. Whatever he does, he wants to be in that situation to love and be loved. But in conditioned life, the living entity tries to do that, but as Purusha, the enjoyer. That is his problem. If he wants to love and be loved, but he wants to do that as the enjoyer. In conditioned life, generally is being uh, looked upon as though this uh, love and be loved means a man and a woman. But with careful analysis, you see that there is always a complication because both persons are striving for the same thing. Both persons, whether male or female, wants to be the Purusha. Wants to be the center of the whole subject matter of enjoyment. Uh, sometimes we see that there is, uh, like in the position of a servant and a master, we see that the servant may be very loyal, loyal to the master, but you see the same Purusha mentality is there in that he is loyal in as much as he receives what is his expectation. Hmm? When his expectation is not met, then his loyalty and begins to dwindle. So, the material world uh, is a place where the this prakriti, this this living entity who is to be enjoyed, is always trying to imitate this Purusha, Krishna, as the enjoyer. Uh, he's always striving for this. Uh, He's acting against the tide of his nature. Uh, so it is explained that yes, this tendency of to enjoy is there within the living entity. That's a fact. But the living entity, when he's covered by this illusionary energy, then he sees things in a perverted way. Just like we like a tree that is standing on the bank of a river is in a perverted way in the river and that the branches and the fruit appears to be upward and the root and the root uh, the root appears to be upward and the the branches appear to be downward so everything is perverted so the living entity uh, being illusion he sees things in a perverted way because uh, he wants to, he has this independence. This is, uh, this independence, that is the costless willingness 
this costless willingness, he wants to use that. Uh, but unfortunately, he tries to use that uh, minute independence in a way that is not conducive to his actual self-interest. Because he's lacking this essential factor of spiritual knowledge. Uh, this knowledge that will enable him to understand his real position as an eternal servant of Krishna. Not as the material body comprised of these elements. Uh, the material body uh, appears to be factual and as a result because it appears to be factual without sufficient knowledge the living entity is constantly bewildered. But he's not able to understand because of lacking of sufficient knowledge why the material body appears to be factual. Uh, uh, it is not that the material body is actually false but it appears to be factual in that it appears to be life. Sometimes you explain to the uh, to the non-devotees uh, about the, the soul being eternal and they have this interpretation that the soul may be eternal but nevertheless the soul depends on this body. Without this body the soul cannot exist. In this way it appears to them that the, the, the soul is eternal but on the other hand apparent, apparently that because the body the soul is so dependent on the body that when the body no longer exists apparently like the soul also don't exist uh, so they are always in a confused state so the eternal soul exists before the body uh, he exists uh, in another body and in this way it goes on going backwards so for this body he exists before this body in another body and upon quitting that body Krishna explained that based on this factor of this Asha Dvesha this acceptance and rejection he has molded a particular type of body with a particular type of senses, a particular type of ears, a particular type of nose, mouth. In this way, you've developed a certain type of consciousness. As a result of that, he is able to accept another body. So, when he accepts another body, amazingly, that the eternal soul becomes comfortable. He becomes comfortable in that new body. He's all, he always finds some sense of gratification even if he is disabled, even if he is sick, uh, he's in an immovable state, uh, he's in a disease state, there is always still some sense of comfort for the living entity. Uh, so, uh, because if you're in a disease state, it means people coming and serve you. Uh, and that's a good thing too. It doesn't, it's not such a bad thing after all. Uh, and even if today you're feeling a little better some, because people come in and serve you, you can still say, well, I'm still feeling sick. So people will give you a little bit more attention. So the living entity, he accepts a hog body. So he's comfortable in that hog body. But those who are intelligent, especially when we have this human form of life, we see that as a degraded position. What we see that as a degraded position on account of we having sufficient intelligence. But the, the hags and dogs, uh, they're not able to understand that. Although it is an eternal soul within this body. And this eternal soul within this body is in a conditioned state. Just like uh, if you have one bulb in this room and that bulb is, uh, the electricity is flowing through that bulb and the, the place is dark and, but you put on the light. So that one light will appear to light up this whole room. But the same one bulb 
if you put a container over it, a dark container or a bowl over it, although it's within the same room, it is, the light is more concentrated, it is more uh, restricted. So similarly, when the living entity is within the body, these lower bodies, then the consciousness becomes more restricted. He's only able to act within a certain degree. That is, he's only able to act in a way to facilitate this propensity of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. He cannot do beyond, he cannot act beyond that. But nevertheless, the propensity of this enjoying propensity is there. He doesn't give up this enjoying propensity. It's part of his nature. But he tries to do that in the form of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Uh, but when he has the human form of life, uh, besides God consciousness, uh, his activities is the same, but in so-called developed manner. That is, uh, uh, he can create a plate to eat on, he can create a bed, he, so in a so-called manner, he appears to uh, act in a more refined manner while performing his materialistic activities or same animalistic activities. But nevertheless, uh, it is the same thing. It doesn't matter you change, you, you avoid eating in a plate and you eat on the floor. The principle is the same, it's eating. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but... The, when one has the human form of life, one is endowed with intelligence. And intelli when one has intelligence, one has to be active. But the activeness of that intelligence is meant to inquire about Krishna, inquire about our real self-interest. So when it is not used in that way, then that's, that propensity of the intelligence now become diverted to the principle of maintaining the material body. Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Creating all kinds of facility, so with the hope of enjoyment. So, when we say the hope of enjoyment, so sometimes a, a, a householder or a rich man uh, will in turn says, you're thinking I'm not enjoying? I have a wife, I have children. Or a wealthy man says, but I have so much amenities. Uh, I have cars, I have big house, I have servant. I, I am not enjoying. In reality, uh, we see that in spite of one having all these assets in the material world, because these assets is not compatible with the eternal soul. The eternal soul is spiritual and these assets, they are dull material matter. So it is not compatible and because it's not compatible, the living entity, he's, he's like uh, a cow, you know, sometimes we see that uh, these uh, persons selling cane juice, they squeeze the juice out of the cane and they throw away the us and then you see the cows going to feed on it and then the hogs going to feed on it. Everybody is going looking for some juice. There may be some little taste, but that little taste is not conducive to give satisfaction to the soul. Because it's not conducive to give satisfaction to the soul, the living entity, therefore the living entity continued to pursue. He's not satisfied. He continued to pursue one thing after another. He's not satisfied with one thing. He may consider, well, having a wife, but after having a wife, he's thinking, but now I have to get a house. And then he get a house. He's thinking, but now I have to get children. And then he get children, but now I has to get excessive bank balance. Now I has to prepare. So he's always pursuing something new, hoping that this will facilitate his happiness. But he's unable, without proper knowledge, the living entity is unable to understand that he's an eternal soul, and that which can satisfy his enjoying propensity has to be of the same nature. 
So, he has to understand, the living entity has to understand that he is not the provider. Just like we take on these bodies at the time of birth. We don't know how we take these bodies. And if we to give credit to our mother and father to having these bodies, yes, we should. But why should we? We should give credit, especially to our mother. We should give credit to our father for having these bodies. But because the mother have undergoes such a tremendous work and endeavor and labor to give birth to us. So she is very important in that regard. But both parents, mother and father, have no knowledge who you were before you take birth. When you take birth, they didn't take birth and saying, well, today we're going to have uh, a ceremony or we're going to indulge in, in the procreation process by which we'll get John or Joan. No, they, they, they didn't do that. They don't know about that. Uh, they didn't even know that at this point in time, uh, that at this point of procreation, now it is the time, now this is a fertile time, and now this is taking place, that I'm, it's, it takes a period of time before the mother can become aware that yes, now I am pregnant. So there, there, is, no, there is no knowledge about this process. So, so we are not the provider of these bodies. Our mother and father are actually not the provider. They are just receptacles by which this whole process is taking place. So when we take birth, we had no knowledge of anything. Uh, in other words, we take birth, when we take birth, we take birth just like an animal. Uh, uh, because we had no knowledge. And then, after taking birth, then the mother and father takes on that responsibility to train us. Uh, uh, to, this is rice, this is, uh, this is good, this is bad. And sometimes you see parents, they says, uh, parents use a term that, uh, that you bring up the children you take, you, you give birth to the children, and then you, you raise the children. They use the term "you raise children." Actually, if you carefully analyze this, it, if children are to be raised, it's like a baker taking yeast, some rising agent, and mix it with the flour, and then he mixes it with the flour, and then he leave it, and then it raises. So, in human society, when children is being raised, you just make children and then you leave them to raise, then you have a disaster. It's like if you put a rising agent in flour and you leave it to raise, if you don't pay attention to it, then you have a disaster because it will flow over. You have to give it a certain amount of time. So similarly, when we take birth, if the parents don't train us, then this is not the behavior or characteristics of a human being. Why? Because we have, we are, the human body is endowed with sufficient intelligence. But even in the animal kingdom, you find that there is a, a certain sense of training, hierarchy. There is always some discipline. The younger ones, they are being disciplined. So... The, in human society, training is essential. Training is what makes the human being, uh, tra training is what makes us having this body to become a human being, training. That's why it says that even after taking birth in the family of a twice born, uh, based on your characteristics and training, that enable you to function in that particular varna. So, it is not just a simple a matter of taking birth. It is a matter of training. 
So, similarly, upon having this human body, uh, not only the training is not only essential to act as a human being, but the training is also essential to act beyond the capacity of a human being. That is, to act in that way that is conducive to our real self, our real self-interest. That is, uh, to act according to our position as an eternal soul. And what is that position? That position is to render loving service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is our real purpose of coming to the temple, staying in the temple, taking training in the temple. Uh, this is our real purpose. If we have other purposes other than understanding this principle, then we don't have sufficient knowledge. And if we maintain that immature state, then we become misguided. We have to understand that we are here to understand what is my real self-interest. My real self-interest is by nature, Anandmaya Biasat. I'm a pleasure seeker. Everything I do in life, with no exception, everything I do in life is all about seeking some pleasure. I have no interest whatsoever to do anything unless I can conceive some way or the other my intelligence can tell me nicely that you will enjoy. Then I will concede, consider this activity should be done. So, my nature is a pleasure seeker and Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. And Krishna has to be the reservoir of all pleasure. Uh, there must be one provider. There must be. Somebody has to be responsible for everything. Sometimes people say that there is no God, there is, this whole world is existing, but there is no one person that is controlling everything. There is no controller. But this is very illogical because everything we see relatively has a controller. The car has an owner, a controller, the house has an owner. Even if you pass and see a dollar on the street or a rupee on the street, it had an owner. Uh, so everything has an owner. So it is wise and easy to conceive that if everything has an owner, there must be an absolute owner of everything. And that absolute owner must designate to different controllers their ability to function. That is, he designate the sun to function. Uh, he designates the rain to function, the wind to function. It must be one absolute controller. And this one absolute controller is Krishna. This is explained in the scripture. Mm -hmm. So, what is our problem in accepting or don't accepting? Uh, those who have faith, those who have acted piously in this life and in previous life, uh, it becomes easy for them to be able to accept. But those who have not acted piously in this life and in previous life, then it is very difficult for them to accept. It is the same eternal soul, but he is in a more conditioned state. He has not evolved in that developed manner by which he can be able to perceive things as they are. So the, the living entity uh, in this conditioned world is struggling very hard for existence because of this conditioned life. What is his actual struggle? The actual struggle is that he's striving to enjoy but he's not getting what is real actual enjoyment that is conducive according to his real self-interest. So this loving service uh, to the Supreme Lord, as aspirants in devotional service, we have to understand carefully that this is our, this is the, this is our motivating factor. Uh, and not only is it motivating, but it is what is conducive to enable us to 
reach that position by which we can actually become happy. And we should strive in devotional service in such a way that we can please Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If we are able to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even if we are not able to act very nicely on the basis of the uh, externals, Varner and Ashram system, but simply by pleasing the Supreme Lord, then everything will automatically become adjusted. So it is our uh, most important endeavor in life to act in such a way on a daily basis. Uh, we have these different prescribed activities to perform. We have our japa to perform. We have services to perform in the temple. But we should constantly remind ourselves that it is only meant to please Krishna. Why is it meant to please Krishna? It's because, uh, uh, because Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. By pleasing Krishna, I will also become pleased. Dharmasya, Sukasya, Kantikasya, Cha. Krishna is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness. So, this Sankirtan movement of chanting Hare Krishna, uh, inaugurated by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is enabling us to have this direct association with the Lord in the form of chanting His holy name. Of course, in our neophyte stage, it's very difficult for us to appreciate that the, the Lord's being His name and none different from His name. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if we, Prabhupada says that whether you understand or you don't understand, if you apply that faith, you accept, then gradually you will be able to understand. So some things in our immature stage may not be comprehensible. But nevertheless, if we accept the words of the authority, why would we accept the words of these authority? Because they are free from the human defects, the propensity to cheat. Uh, they're, not, they're free from making mistakes. So because of they're free from these defects and conditioned life, then we can accept what they are offering us without hesitation. And if we have some, uh, some doubt, uh, we don't just try to justify that doubt, but we try to clarify that doubt so that we can have a, a clear understanding of the subject matter so that we can progress in Krishna consciousness. In, in this way, if we act nicely in Krishna consciousness, then the process becomes clear and easy for us. But if we strive in Krishna consciousness, very doubtful, very obstinate, very rebellious, uh, disrespectful to superiors, not being able to give proper respect to superiors, uh, then the process becomes very difficult for us. Uh, uh, and the mind, the mind, again, will enable us to understand that the path of material enjoyment is the best process for us. Again, we will have to leave the process of Krishna consciousness and again find ourselves fully engrossed in materialistic activities. So we don't want that. So we have to take whatever necessary precautions in our devotional service to protect ourselves, to act nicely, act respectfully, uh, dedicate ourselves to the process, uh, in Krishna consciousness, acting such a way that Krishna can see us. Uh, and if we act in such a way that Krishna can see us, then we will be in a very fortunate position. 
So again, this process of loving service to Krishna is consistent with our nature as an eternal soul. And these bodies, they are being maintained because of the eternal soul. Not only just the eternal soul, but essentially because of the Lord as Paramatma within the body. Uh, because of Paramatma, uh, he enables us, the eternal soul, to manipulate, to coordinate the senses of this, these bodies. Uh, but the living entity by himself has no power on his own with the exception of the will of the Lord. So, although the will of the Lord is there, just as we see here, that inspired by the, the Lord, Sukracharya, of course, Bali Maharaj. Hmm. So, in, in this case, it will look a little contradictory. Why would the Lord inspire Sukracharya to course his devotee? Uh, not only that uh, Bali Maharaj was a devotee of the Lord, uh, but he was completely dedicated in the interest of the Lord. Had he not had the interest of the Lord, then he would have fall prey to Sukracharya uh, dictates. But the Lord's he had the Lord's interest. How to please the Lord? If I please the Lord then I'll be pleased also. So, why would the Lord dictate? So, the Lord is always there to satisfy everyone. The demons desire something, the Lord may facilitate his desire. If the Lord doesn't facilitate the desires of the demons, they will not be able to function in a certain way. But, for the devotees, whether the demons act in the interest or against the interests of the devotees, the devotee remains steadfast in his devotional service to the Lord. And the devotee becomes even more devoted to the Lord. As we see in the instance of Supracharya coursing Bali Maharaj. Yes, Bali Maharaj uh, loses position, loses everything, but he attained the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Hmm? which is more valuable than any material asset. So, sometimes we, as in our, especially in our beginning stages of devotional service, we sometimes are reinforced with these situations. Our parents, uh, friends, so-called well-wishers may try to advise us against uh, engaging in the devotional service of the Lord or dedicating our life. Sometimes we even see, even our wives or husbands may even, uh, sometimes there are problems, even household relationship, even among devotees, that the husband or the wife may want to be uh, a little bit more dedicated to the devotional service of the Lord. And the husband or the wife may on the other side not be very supportive these kinds of things. So these adversities for the devotees strengthen the devotee. Mm. Whereas for the non-devotees it weakens them, it makes them more, it, make, it strengthens them but it strengthens them in conditioned life. So, but for the devotee he becomes strengthened in spiritual life. So sometimes we see uh, that People with short-sighted vision, they are a little disturbed in, in sometimes in the Lord dealings with his devotees as to why the devotees are allowed to suffer. In reality, we have these bodies, we are not the bodies. For one who is fully aware of himself as being an eternal soul, does not, although there may be pain inflicted on the body, nevertheless, he understands that I'm an eternal soul. 
and upon leaving this body, I have an eternal existence. And that eternal existence is based on an eternal relationship with Krishna. So he is not overly uh, overwhelmed by the suffering of this body. But ordinary people, not having this understanding, thinks that why should the devotee suffer in this way? Just as we see in the instance of Prahlad Maharaj, undergoes so many different suffering. But ultimately, what, did it, what, what was the results? As a result of these suffering, Prahlad Maharaj was, enabled, was able to awaken the mercy of the Lord all the time because of his constant remembrance of the Lord. So, uh, as devotees, we should not expect that uh, some kind of a pleasure circumstances to always be around this body. There may be sometimes we may have a nice prasadam, they may, be, may have a nice bed to sleep, or maybe a comfortable room. There may be sometimes about this situation. But this should not be our goal. This, the, we should understand that our goal is centered around pleasing the Supreme Personality of God, and rendering devotional service to the Lord in such a way that the Lord will become pleased. And in order to do that, it is meant that it has to be loving service to the Lord. By this loving service to the Lord, in whatever our activities we may have to perform, whether it is hearing, whether it is chanting, whether it is remembering, doing services, it is all about rendering loving service to the Lord simply for His pleasure. So I guess we can stop here. Is there any question? Yes, Hare Krishna. Okay, Mataji, just a minute. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare Krishna. For the nice class. In the purport, Prabhupada is explaining that Krishna gives intelligence to his devotees because they are dedicated to him. And in this, this verse we are seeing that Lord is inspiring Shukracharya to give the curse to Bali Maharaj. So, how is Lord inspiring Shukracharya being a non-devotee? Mm. In one instance is like fire. An expert cook will utilize a fire in such a way that he'll cook a nice preparation. Irresponsible person will utilize fire in such a way that it will become a major disaster. So, Sukracharya cursing Bali Maharaj is a disaster for Sukracharya. Uh, Bali Maharaj, on the other hand, because of his interest in serving the Lord, uh, is awakening the Lord's causeless mercy upon him. So, the Krishna says that I am the intelligence of the intelligence. I'm seated in the heart of every living entity. I give intelligence. Um, so, this intelligence is based on we has desire. We have a freedom of will. In this will, freedom of will, we act in a certain way. We, based on this Asia Dvesha acceptance and rejection, we are going in a certain path, wanting certain things. And the Lord facilitate these things. Why? So that eventually, in a course of time, we'll become burnt out and realize the usefulness. If the Lord doesn't facilitate our desires, the desires of the demons, the desires of the devotees, or even the desires of the neophyte devotee, if the Lord doesn't facilitate, in the neophyte stage, we may just be interested in having nice prasadam. If the Lord doesn't facilitate that, then why would you stay here? The Lord has to facilitate your desires. And there will be nice prasadam. Uh, so you can stay on. And gradually, you will understand in the course of time, uh, as you become mature, then you will understand that this, this is not what I really want. And, and by hearing from the devotees, and you will understand higher principles. So the, 
these personalities, Shukracharya, in persons who may be in these exalted position, who may not, as far as this life may concern, may not be eligible to perform pure devotional service. But nevertheless, the process, the Lord is there within the heart of every living entity, and he's helping him. Even though he may facilitate a desire that may not be conducive to pure devotional service, but it, that facilitating that desire may be enabling the living entity to exhaust his material desires. So the Lord is a heaven well-wisher. He's doing good for everyone. Uh, some he, he do good by taking away. Some he does good by facilitating. Like the fire does good all the time. If you're responsible, you do good. You burn down the whole house. That's what you do you, because you're irresponsible. If you're very expert in cooking, the fire will do good also. You take care, you cook a nice meal. So, again, the living entity, based on his, he develops a certain pattern in life based on this acceptance and rejection. And the Lord, he sees that from within the heart, allows the living entity within to a certain capacity so that then gradually the living entity becomes burnt out and then he in the association of sadhus devotees hearing from the scripture then he'll begin to gradually turn his face to the lord yes mataji uh, mataji wanted to ask a question Hare Krishna. Hare I, Krishna. Guess, I guess in a way you've answered the question, but I'll still rephrase the same question. It's like uh, Shukrachar is a materialistic guru, and in a sense, everybody is under such a guru. So who can control this guru which affects even us as devotees? I didn't get the question. Yeah, I'm saying that... Uh, you can talk a little louder. Hare Krishna. Yeah. The Shukracharya is a materialistic guru, and in a sense, everybody has some influence of this materialistic, materialistic guru in our lives. So, so who can control this guru? Basically, we are eternal souls. We've been given these bodies so that gradually we can give up our propensity, our false activities to act against Krishna and act in the interest of being a devotee of Krishna. So, uh, it is unfortunate when the living entity happened to come where he has to take shelter of persons who will give him that kind of a knowledge that will not enable him to understand his eternal nature as an eternal soul and able to awaken this propensity of loving service to the Lord. That's an unfortunate situation. But nevertheless, if one is sincere, if one is sincere, Krishna, uh, will gradually help to get out of these entanglement, these associations. Uh, just like in, the, in one sense you can see that Krishna enabled Bali Maharaj to get out of that association by that course, by that rejection. Uh, he, Bali Maharaj, was able to get out of that, that association. So Krishna has this way in doing things. So hopefully we are sincere enough to render loving service to Krishna and Krishna will uh, take care of us and help us to get out of these bad association. But if we stay in this bad association, then we are not able to progress in devotional service. So I guess we can stop here. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai.